So here we're going to talk about the octet rule. And remember, the octet rule is the sort of what guides us in figuring out how things usually bond when we're drawing Lewis structures. And of course, like any rule, there are lots of exceptions. Some of them are a little more obvious, some of them are not so much. So we've talked about the concept of formal charge in determining um, which is our most stable resonance structure. And one of the things we need to keep in mind is that having a formal charge being zero is actually much more important than the octet rule is. So the first notable exception of the octet rule is what we're going to call odd electron molecules, meaning the total number of valence electrons is an odd number. If it's an odd number, then it's physically impossible to give everybody eight electrons. So let's consider nitrogen monoxide. So nitrogen has five valence electrons, six, oxygen has six valence electrons for a total of 11. So we follow our idiot proof guide for drawing those structures, and we draw our skeletal structure, and then we place the remaining electrons around the outermost atom, giving them an octet. Now, in this case, we have two atoms, so the question is, which one is the outermost atom? Well, if you recall, the rule for figuring out why we do the outermost atoms is because those are the most electronegative, generally. So, given the choice of who gets their octet first, we basically go with the more electronegative element. So, in this case, it would be oxygen. So, we're going to give oxygen its octet, so that's two, four, six, eight, which means we have three left, and we put those remaining electrons around the nitrogen, one, two, three. So if we look at our nitrogen in this case, we see that nitrogen is one, two, three, four, five electrons around it. So it is below the octet rule, obviously, and it wants three more, but it's physically impossible for it to get three more, even with the sharing, any sharing that goes on with these oxygens. Oxygen has its octet, but if you recall, oxygen's formal charge in this case, with three lone pairs and one bond, its, ox its formal charge is actually minus one, so it's not really that happy. So nitrogen's at five, wants to get to eight. We can't get it to eight, because there's an odd number, but we can at least get a little bit closer. So if we make a multiple bond, take away one of those lone pairs, make a double bond between the nitrogen and oxygen, now oxygen has a formal charge of zero, and more importantly, or just as importantly, if we look at the nitrogen, it starts with five valence electrons, and if we calculate the formal charge, one, two, three, four, five. The, our rule for formal charge, we basically take half of each of the pairs of electrons that are shared, so one electron each one of these bonds, and then all the electrons that are sort of owned by the nitrogen. So the formal charge in this nitrogen is in fact zero, which, as it says right up there, formal charge equals zero, more important than octet rule. So if we can come up with a resonance structure, or a Lewis structure, or a structure structure, where everybody has a zero formal charge, all is well with the world. What about nitrogen dioxide? Nitrogen dioxide is an also a odd electron molecule because we have 16 electrons. I'm sorry, we have six electrons from two oxygens, that's a total of 12, plus five more, so that's 17. Nitrogen is less electronegative, so we put her in the center. Then we put the remaining electrons around the octet, or on the outer atoms to give them an octet, so the oxygen, then remaining electrons puts our lone electron around the nitrogen. Again, just following our rules for drawing Lewis structures. And again, our nitrogen is short three electrons, because it has one, two, three, four, five electrons around it. We can't get it to an octet, because we don't have enough electrons, but we can get it at least to seven, which is better than nothing. And so we actually have two different resonance structures. We can make a double bond with a, multiple, a double bond with this oxygen on the left, or a double bond with this oxygen on the right, both of which will make the nitrogen get to seven. And in this case, the formal charge of the nitrogen is not zero like it was up here in the nitrogen monoxide. But this is as close as we can get it. We can't have these electrons drop over and make the nitrogen you might say, oh, and I just make a multiple bond, and then won't nitrogen's formal charge be equal to zero? If we made a double bond here, that would make nitrogen's formal charge zero. Why can't we do that? Well, because that violates the rules of how many electrons you can have in ni around a nitrogen. If we were to put a double bond here, then there would be two, four, six, eight, nine electrons, and it is, sadly, physically impossible for nitrogen to hold nine electrons around it. So we basically get these two resonance structures, and in both cases we have a double bonded oxygen who's happy with a formal charge of zero. We have a nitrogen with a formal charge of plus one, an oxygen a formal charge of minus one. 
And then same thing over here. We have one oxygen who's slightly upset, nitrogen who's a plus one, oxygen is a zero. So these are energetically equivalent and equally stable. So the bond order in each one of these cases would, or the bond order in the real structure of nitrogen dioxide would be one and a half. Some other exceptions. What about uh, what if we just don't have enough electrons to make any octets? So, for example, beryllium hydride. Beryllium hydride has it gives us a total of four valence electrons, and there they are. There's beryllium, hydrogen, hydrogen, and there's our four electrons. And um, we're done. Beryllium can have an octet, but it doesn't want an octet. Beryllium, in this case, has a formal charge of zero because it starts with two valence electrons. It's in group two, and Take one from there, one from there, gives us a formal charge of zero. Boron trifluoride. So boron with three fluorines. This is the structure we come up with after step four. So we draw our skeletal structure. The boron is the least like a negative, put it in the center, bonded to three fluorines. We take the remaining electrons, put them around the outer fluorines, and we're out of electrons. And you'll notice that the boron is, in fact, short its octet. It only has six electrons around it. And so you'd be tempted to make a multiple bond with one of the fluorines. And then we talk about, you know, it could be this one or this one or this one. And they're all genetically equivalent. We do that whole bond order one and a third thing. But that won't work. If we look at the boron in this case, in this configuration, or in this structure, the boron has a formal charge of zero because it's got three valence electrons. Subtract off one from each of the bonds, minus three. So its formal charge is zero. And the fluorines all have a formal charge of zero. If we were to do that thing that we thought about, which was making a multiple bond with a fluorine by making a double bond, then what we get is um, not only does the boron have a formal charge of minus one, but we have made the fluorine a formal charge of plus one. Fluorine, the most electronegative element on the entire periodic table, you want to make it a plus one charge. Um, yeah, not happening. So that is a big fat no-no. So that's if we didn't have enough electrons. What if we have too many electrons? Well, there are some atoms, and we're going to talk about later why we can do this. Just At this point, you just have to trust me, that there are some atoms, row three and higher, that can hold greater than eight electrons. And what I mean by row three and higher is row three, row four, row five. So sulfur and chlorine, phosphorus, at that row and below it on the periodic table. Uh, or put another way, that nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, carbon, those cannot. It is physically impossible for them to hold more than eight electrons. We'll talk about it later when we talk about hybridization. So at this point, just press the I believe button in that only row of three and higher, so sulfur, chlorine, bromine, things down there, can have an expanded octet. So uh, let's try phosphorus pentafluoride. Well, phosphorus pentafluoride, uh, there are five fluorines. And so if we add up our number of valence electrons, we get a total of 40. And so phosphorus pentafluoride will give us, if we follow our rules, this is where we are after step four. And we've run out of electrons. And you should notice right now that the phosphorus, the central phosphorus, doesn't have eight electrons around it. It's got 10 electrons around it. Um, it had 10 electrons around it before we got done with step three. It's got 10 electrons around it here, um, clearly in violation of the octet rule. But it says phosphorus pentafluoride, so it must be five fluorines bonded to it. And this certainly exists. So we draw our structure, and we've run out of valence electrons, and all of our outer atoms have an octet. Oh, that's awesome. But that central phosphorus does not. It's got 10 electrons. Is that OK? Sure. What's its formal charge? Oh, well, the formal charge on the phosphorus is 5 minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I guess it's all good, because everybody has a formal charge of zero. What about sulfur hex? Well, there's sulfur hexafluoride. And it has a total of 40 valence electrons. And sulfur bonded to six fluorines. Well, there's two, four, six, eight, ten. The sulfur already is violating the octet rule. And we're not even to step three yet. Um, there's step three, placing the remaining electrons around the outer atoms. And if you count really, really quick, you'll get to 48. They're all there. I don't have any extra to put on the sulfur. And so the sulfur is clearly in violation of the octet rule. Should we be concerned? Nope. Because sure enough, the formal charge on that sulfur is also zero. Because we take six minus one, two, three, four, five, six. 
So it's formal charge of zero, and that's all that's important. One more example, and that is chlorine pentafluoride. Chlorine pentafluoride. Chlorine pentafluoride has a total of 42 valence electrons, and here we are after step three, placing the remaining electrons on their atoms, and that is actually only 40 electrons shown, and we have 42 valence electrons, so we draw our five, put in our five bonds, put in our lone pairs around all the fluorines, make all the fluorines happy, and we've only got 40 electrons, so we still have to follow our, our rules that step four says place any remaining electrons you have around the central atom, so we drop them there on our chlorine, following our rules. And now what's our formal charge on our chlorine? Well, if I take seven valence electrons, which is what chlorine has, and subtract off everything that's wholly owned, so that lone pair, and one, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the formal charge on the chlorine is zero. All the fluorines is zero. This is the most stable resonance structure. This is the only resonance structure because we have a structure where everybody has a formal charge of zero. Happy, happy, joy, joy.